How many people here were at the show just a minute ago? Yay! Come on, bring it up. These guys were great. Yeah. Oh, that's too thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'm not. I'm going to uh, first off embarrass Kurt. That's so, hard to do, but go ahead. All right, all right, Randy, you've been doing magic for a while, right? A little while, yeah. <laughs> so you want, you asked me if you think Kurt, you or after the show, you thought you said, do you think he'd be able to take some ideas and why don't you share the idea because I think it's ap ap apropos to people who like like magic. Well what idea are you talking about? With then? the with the rope. With the rope. Yes, but I think that's something we should discuss here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I would prefer to discuss why we call him the honest liar, I guess. <laughs> well we can we can give him an idea. Um, yeah. so uh, the amazing one was gracious enough to make a suggestion on a subtlety that would would make uh, one of the routines that I did more uh, aesthetically pleasing to the audience. And it's something that he spots keenly that I can't see from where I'm at. It was a tremendous suggestion. And it's I liken it to um, a soundtrack to a movie. Um, if I make the change, which I will, it's not something that the average person would ever notice, but just like the soundtrack to a movie, if it's a really great soundtrack, you don't realize you've heard it. But if you recognize a soundtrack, then there's something wrong. So uh, With he, you. he saw something. You're a bad person if you recognize the soundtrack. That's right, that's yeah. right. Well, it's funny you say that because uh, I saw once, uh, the, to make your point, that I saw somebody actually show you the difference if you have a bad soundtrack. Somebody actually cut together the, the really cool scenes from Star Wars with bad music, and believe it or not, even though you know the movie, you love it, it sucked. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy how much that makes yeah. a difference. Yeah. That little things really make a difference, and I think that's pretty much magic. Yeah. So if you, uh, if you see me here again in a couple years, the show will be better. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps not much, but next to ten. <laughs> I can only deal with what I've got to work with. <laughs> That's true. That's I'm, true. It's a low ceiling for me. <laughs> well, the, I'll start over with Brian. You have that funny video at the beginning with you. Is that actually you? That yeah, video? no, that's that's definitely me. I'm definitely eight years old, and that is my Siegfried and Roy uh, 201 Magic Kit, and that is me clearly well practiced and well rehearsed before recording it for all posterity. I figured that uh, you know if you start with that show, uh, you can't. Oh, you can only go up from there. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. As a Siegfried and Roy magic kit. I didn't know they made them. Yeah, no, back in the day. That's uh, And I'm wearing a, a, my ninja outfit, as a good magician should. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I grew up in Vegas, so... Yeah, that. <laughs> I couldn't see you at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you've always been a magician? Uh, no, you know, I, I only had a passing interest in magic, and I'd be interested to hear you, your take on this. Uh, I, I, I got the kit, and I was like, oh, I like magic. I learned a few tricks, and then I forgot about it. Uh, it wasn't until um, I was 18 years old, about to go to University of Texas at Austin, when a friend of mine showed me a trick, a uh, key card effect, and wouldn't tell me how it was done. And it was actually out of rage uh, that I decided, well, screw you. I'm going to be a better magician than you ever were. And so made a, you know, guess who's got suddenly more free time than he's had in his whole life? And so, uh, and so I'm still, you know, sticking it to Gordon Prince. Uh, <laughs> so it's the, you know, the Fleetwood Mac Rumors album version of <laughs> yes, you know, Becoming Better. Uh, only is my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so they've basically been wanting to be a magician pretty much from uh, that video. Well, and what's funny is I never, I fell into magic. Uh, it seemed to me that no matter where I ended up in life, magic would be a good background and hobby to have. Um, and it never occurred to me that I would be a full-time magician un until the day I quit my job. And then I, and even then, I was like, it was more a case of like, I just want to get this out of my system so I can't be that guy who always wonders what might have been. And then, uh, you know, a couple of years later, I was on The Tonight Show, and then, you know, was... <laughs> <laughs> Away we go. Yeah, yeah, away we go, yeah. And, and now, earlier today, we found out about Randy and his journey to magic, and that was, you know, he was a, you know, full body cast, and he really liked the levitation tri trick by Blackstone, and you have always been a skeptic of some sort, right, Randy? Oh, yes, I doubt that. Yeah. <laughs> how, about, how about you, Brian? We go the same character. No, I, I actually, uh, I was, I was fairly um, uh, credulous, and and again, just because I, I, 
uh, most of my childhood, I could hold on to uh, incongruous beliefs and not really worry about it. And it wasn't until, for me, there was a galvanizing moment. I took a class at the University of Texas at Austin called Pseudoscience and the Paranormal by Dr. Rory Coker. And uh, he basically broke down uh, day one, lesson one, here's the actual history of astrology. And he presented the entire thing without any bias or, you know, with, with, with a bit of an eye roll here or there, but, but it was all factual. And there's no way you can go through an entire semester of Occam's Razor, astrology, Bigfoot, UFOs, uh, and, and come out the other side, you know, still feeling like, well, maybe. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it was wonderful. And as a result of that class, I, I consulted with him. And once I started touring colleges, sort of did a 90 minute long greatest hits of his uh, stuff. And that lecture is still up with uh, completely with my ridiculous hairstyle. Uh, if you just search for a scam Sasquatch in the supernatural. Well, you we got to see that. Well, but had, last year, last you year. Had, you had that hairstyle until like last year. 20 minutes ago, yeah. <laughs> last year. And the reason why is because you got on TV. Uh, yeah, it turns out they want adults on television. <laughs> <laughs> now, Kurt. Why good to Kurt? Anybody with a smartphone, pull up like you know Google, search for Kurt Anderson. Well, I talked to him for a moment, and then look at your results. It's kind of funny. So Kurt, who's yeah. your doppelganger? Um, namesake wise, yeah. There's a uh, there's a Christian musician that plays the piano named Kurt Anderson, and he fills. He's one of those hand waving fills giant stadiums guys. Right. Yeah, and he just started kind of advertising on Google the last couple of years. Oh, and yeah. so I ran into his family. <laughs> I ran into his family in Ohio, and they're like, oh, you have the same name as our son. I said, I'm, I'm your age. He's got the same name as me, but okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's got to be like a whole bunch of Kurt Andersons in this world. You yes, know, but I'm just one of them. Was, I only, uh, it's funny because I talked to him first time when he got here, I was like, you know, I got like more than like four or five emails from people who said, I was looking at the schedule. Is this Kurt? <laughs> <laughs> There's like a picture of this guy with a piano and he's flying and he's talking about Jesus. It's like, no. D different <laughs> one. Different one. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. So how did you get um, him out Like the exact opposite of Brian. <laughs> you know, we all have our own path in life. So um, you, like, you weren't like seven years old with a magic kit? I was seven years old with a magic kit, okay. exactly. Uh, well, not a magic kit. Actually, my dad, this was before the internet, of Bullshit course. Bullshit, right? like the staple gun? Yeah, uh, he took me to the mall, and, and he bought me a magic trick, and he said, here's the deal. I'll take you home. I'll teach you how to do this. You practice at home in front of a mirror. Um, you show me when you've got it down, then you can show your mom and your brother, and then your friends. And if you don't tell anybody, in a couple months, I'll buy you another one. So within about six months, I had all the little magic tricks, and we could name off the sponge rabbits and all the different things. And then the family reunion came up, so they said, well, we'll buy a tabletop stratospheres. And uh, so then another one, another one, and it's a phase I never grew out of. Now, did you do that because you, you just wanted free entertainment for family gatherings? Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just probably he probably charged admission. Um, <laughs> No, my dad supported everything we ever did as kids. I, I, I got into magic, and I never found another hobby. Um, and then I ended up doing it as a career and just never stopped. My brother had a different hobby every six months, and whatever his was, my dad would buy him that. Well, you know, he gets done with that, he buys him something else. And to me, it's just bigger magic tricks. So you never, like, got into diamonds then? No, You no. didn't think about that, did you? Yeah, I should have, right? <laughs> you know, or I mean, bonds. Plat platinum, right. <laughs> so were you always the, and then a skeptic? Because of it? Uh, there's, a, there's a certain inherent um, skepticism as a magician because it's this idea of processing mysteries and they're no longer mysteries and, and vice versa. It helps to look at it both directions. But I wouldn't say I was like officially a skeptic. Really, I would say Dragon Con had a lot to do with that. Yeah. And uh, I've been to Dragon Con since 1991. Uh, our first year, my wife was the best Betty Page in the Betty Page contest. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, actually, uh, I actually DM'd. I was one of the, the DMs for the first ever $5,000 cash prize Dungeons & Dragons tournament. Uh, in 1991. No, the, 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 chal the challenge here. Yeah. So um, we were there, and, and so we just come 
pretty much. This is the one weekend a year that I don't book a show. With what we do, you book a show anytime you can, yeah. but I don't do it during Dragon Con. And my wife said, well, if you're not going to book a show during Dragon Con, see if you could do one at Dragon Con. And so that's when I contacted <laughs> well, I, uh, you. Well, you see, I, you know you come in, came up to me a few times before you said you I want to do a show. Right. And I remember right. you saying you were a magician, but I never thought to say, well, yeah, I... I I'm going to, like, use your talent. Like, well, it wasn't you. until you had Randy a few yeah. years ago that I even thought about that being, you know, it's, it's kind of like throwing cards. Um, I threw cards since I was seven years old. I can throw one 45, 50 yards, and I never thought about that as being a talent until I was after a show. I was showing somebody how to throw cards, and everybody's like, throw one to me, throw one to me, and it looked like, um, you know, like a Major League Baseball game batting practice. And I went, I've got to put this in the show. So I actually took a trick that I hate and added it to the show so I could throw cards and it makes sense. Um, and you still hate it, I guarantee I still, I still hate it, yeah, but I, I still tell. do it. Um, but it's, it's not a card trick, but it gives, it gives me the premise to throw cards in the audience. Oh, the one people you hate. The, yeah, I throw it at the people I hate, yeah, to try to cut them. And so I just, I upped my uh, liability insurance. And so, yeah. Yeah, so then you did sketches and then I followed it. Yeah, so it got more into the skepticism movement, and, and actually when Mr. Randy did a, a couple lectures here, as I would say, when it was more like officially, oh, this is actually an official movement, you know, and uh, really familiar with what you do and all, but I, I just never thought about it as like people would travel from all over the world to talk about this together. Yeah. And then people like Margaret right here and, and all that she does all over the place. And, and roped you into the parade, I guarantee it. Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> If you saw somebody in the parade in a skirt and a blue wig and sunglasses, that was me. Yeah. I'm sure your wife yeah, has the truth pictures. Yeah. <laughs> you do, yeah. Don't you? Yes, she does. Yes, she does. So, yeah. So that's kind of the that in a nutshell. Yeah. Well, then that brings me something. Um, I know. I, I'm. I'm just. This is a bait question, but I know the answer. So. Magicians should be skeptical, I would say. Would you agree with this? Ever be on the panel? I think everybody should be. Well, yeah, but I mean, especially <laughs> oh, people body in a, slam. In a, Damn. People in a career. <laughs> people in a career. This is my last dragon count, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> especially people in a career where all you do is trick people, right? Yeah. Well, I I, I did a lecture at the University of Alabama recently on uh, deception and lying. And I asked everybody, I said, what's, what's your opinion if somebody says that they're going to deceive you? And I said, would you say it's a positive or a negative? And everybody said, oh, it's a negative. I said, but it's, it's not always. I said, my job is to deceive you and you should like me for it or I'm not doing my job. And so deception isn't always a negative. You have to kind of qualify that. But then it, just, it was more to get them to think about if we just think of things the same way all the time, we're never going to get anywhere. We have to think of... You know, now you could probably get back to deception at the core is a bad thing, but, you know, it, I mean, people like politicians better if, if they know they're being deceived by them, oddly enough. Yeah. The, the I politicians. Heard yeah. I heard the word Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. By the way, I, 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 this is completely not off, on the top at all, but the whole Trump thing confuses me. The man bankrupted two, the same hotel twice, a casino. Casinos. In the desert, with no water around them, they made a city there. He owns a big casino, and he bankrupted it twice. But everybody's saying, the Republicans are saying, he'd be great for us. Okay. And then he has most of his hotels that he's famous for in foreclosure. So why do people like him? Let, let's take away all everything else he said, the racist guy, and say, so what the hell? I mean, it, to me. So, anyway, is there any questions for the audience? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, the, to go on topic, right? Yeah. So, I know you guys, being magicians, know of several magicians who are probably not skeptical at all, or there, there's probably quite a few. Mm -hmm. Or do you think some of the ones who aren't skeptical, do you think they do it just for audience? There's a a number of fantastic lectures uh, available in bootleg format. You can listen to a robot read off PDFs from uh, Michael Crichton. Uh, and <laughs> un unfortunately, Michael Crichton turned out to be on the, uh, you know, by all evidence, uh, on the wrong side of the global warming issue, but he was on the right side of skeptical thinking in general. I think that just uh, the, the, there was less you know, firmly established science at the time, and he, he made the call 
for more skepticism of the media. And one of the things that he brought up was what he called uh, the Murray Gell-Mann effect. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. uh, Murray yeah. Gell-Mann, uh, ph ph physicist, right? Oh, um, wow. So, so uh, what, what he would do is he noticed he was, he was speaking to Murray Gell-Mann, and he would be, you know, he would watch him open up a newspaper, find a physical uh, article on physics news, and be like, this is hogwash. This is bullshit. This is wrong. This is 87 varieties of stupid. Uh, and then go on to the next article and be all like, oh, but this all makes sense. <laughs> you know, so uh, we all have our particular category where we are experts. And I think that many magicians, uh, for example, uh, salesmen. I think salesmen, I, I n recognize when different gambits are being used on them in the sales department, uh, which is a skeptical-like talent. But then the moment you get outside of that and you have to start you know, using uh, the, the techniques of deceivers and magicians, they don't recognize it being used. And I think that magicians are just as human in that regard. And I think, Randy, you're, you're gonna have a, a whole book about this, right? I'm forming it up in my head right now. <laughs> but then I'm making working, notes below the yeah, head. Yeah, I mean, I mean, because this even applies to the people who should never be deceived scientists. Yeah. And so you have a whole book about this. You've seen this happen. So yeah. Oh, yes, yes. I've got a, an extensive chapter in the new book, A Magician in the Laboratory, which I'm sure you're dying to buy <laughs> when it is published. But uh, not before that, though. Uh, yes, I've got a whole chapter in there that deals with exactly this. Uh, people in science, deeply inside science, who are so self-deceived, though they're well-trained academically and, and rationally and uh, logically, the whole thing, and yet they can come to exactly the wrong conclusion and stick with it no matter what. I've even had some of them come to me and say, you know, you, you made your point and I have to accept that. And I would smugly go away and say, hey, I won another one, you see. But you and actually hold, did a whole, I wouldn't say sting operation, but you, you, you basically put some people into laboratories and show the scientists that this happens. Yeah, well, the, the Alpha Project yeah. was one of those, and we'll all read about it eventually, won't we? <laughs> uh, yes, and in which we, I simply got two very talented uh, young men who did mentalism, and only as amateurs at that point. I wanted to use amateurs, but those I, I could see had some promise, and we put them into a laboratory, and we let the the, psych the psych pardon, parapsychologists, I almost identified them with real science. <laughs> uh, uh, we let them make the decision as to which ones they were going to choose, and lots of people applied, and the two of them that, that, that won the position of uh, being the, the infiltrators in the laboratory, they came up with the most incredible stories, just unbelievable, but that's what appealed to the parapsychologists, and they said, oh yeah, these are our guys, no question of hey, it. Hey James, do you think that there's some aspect of the culture of magicians that uh, is fundamentally different from uh, scientists? Because it seems like uh, many scientists, if you admit you're wrong, that's kind of the end of your academic, or at least that arc of your academic career. That's um, true. Whereas among magicians, there's no higher compliment to be paid to someone than you got me. That fooled me. Yeah, and then, yeah. you know, here we, we live in an like, age you know, where... The, the, the really well-received show by Penn and Teller. Penn and Teller, right. Fool Wait, me. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Penn and Teller Fool Us does a great job yeah, of kind us, of extending yeah. that culture out there. Um, uh, do you suppose that has something to do... Uh, is, is that a fundamental difference between sciences, and is that something that can be reconciled? It's, it's a highly variable quality in people as to whether or not they can actually say that they were wrong. Now, academically... That's sometimes the kiss of death right away if you have to say, oh, I wrote this book and it's all wrong. Uh, duh. Uh, that, that can be the end if you're right there as far as your, your, uh, your validity goes with the rest of science and in some cases with the public. But it should not be. And uh, some scientists who have made that decision and have uh, confessed their, their inability to tell between the right thing and the wrong thing, uh, they have they've done very well after that, but not many, not do, many, do you and think not many want to do it. Do you think we've seen any shift in climate? Because I have to believe in an age where some post uh, can one day be the top thing on Reddit, and the next day, you know, suddenly be BT dubs, you know, then none of that's true, and the internet goes like, oh, yeah, no, that's evidence, thanks. Like, are, are we seeing a shift among, among people in general towards uh, accepting? Because I, I know for, uh, the reason I ask is for me personally, 
uh, there was nothing better than reading the works of uh, Elizabeth Loftus, who showed us just how flawed our oh, memories great. are, how we manufacture memories. Before reading about her stuff, I would think, okay, I don't remember everything, but the stuff I remember did happen. And of course, experiment after experiment shows that we manufacture consistent narrative because we're story-driven individuals. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the climate has changed, and and or or, or and can it? Oh, I believe it, it can change, and I believe it is to a certain extent, with certain people, of course. But I must say something else to my biographer, uh, who lives in the upper part of the United States. Uh, she once called me <laughs> right in the middle of the day uh, with strange questions. She said, uh, your first jailbreak was done in Quebec City, is that right? I said, yeah. And she said, I've got all the details here, uh, but it wasn't in Quebec City. I said, I remember distinctly it was in Quebec City. Oh, My yes. hands were tied up to the bars of the cell, <laughs> and I, I was in shackles. And, uh, we're all talking yeah, French. Oh, all the, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I remember it so distinctly and such. And she said, well, I'm sending you a newspaper clipping. Click, and that's it. Sent me a newspaper clipping. No, it was in Lachine, Quebec, uh, in quite some distance away from uh, Quebec City, as a matter of fact. But for years, I had been telling audiences such as this that, that I did my first jailbreak in Quebec City, and I wasn't lying. That's the, the interesting thing. No, I was telling it the way I had remembered it, and I've learned since from leading psychologists, and I could name a dozen of them that have told me the same thing. The last time you tell a story and you really believe it's true, that's the version that you'll carry. And 20 minutes later, you may tell the same story again, or two days or two years, but it's the last time that you tell it to an audience uh, earnestly that freezes in your memory, and that's the version of it. I've now had to change my mind completely, and I've, I'm trying to still search down the 20,000 people that I've spoken to over the years. <laughs> I, I, I think you bring up a good point in that there's a difference between lying and being wrong. And I think oh, yeah. that one should be heavily stigmatized and the other should have less of a stigma. Absolutely. I think I think that we're uh, in, in the history of mankind, there's less of a culture of, you know, it's less problematic to admit you are wrong now than at any point, you know, uh, previously, I would think. Wait, I'm wait, wait, you're married, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well played, good sir. Point. As I've often said to my audience. It's not in my house. <laughs> often said to my audience, as I said, would I lie to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. I've heard of many, there's a lot of magicians who do the things like Christian magic. And do you think that it's a self deception or more of what Randy's trying to say in the way that they've made a memory in themselves that says that this is actually miracles or whatever. I, I think that skepticism has an opportunity to cast a very wide net and I want everybody we can get into the skeptical net. And yeah. if those people happen to be religious, that is wonderful and, and great because um, they're clearly, uh, you know, Carl Sagan talks about how there's not a single society in the history of mankind that evolves without uh, anthropologically some form of religious uh, uh, bias. Yeah, right? I mean, cargo are, cults even prove that. Sure, sure. We, 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 are, we are built to, yeah. to, to believe in that regard. And there are people who are able to separate their faith from the rest of their life. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And if they draw strength from that, then good, good for them. Um, I, I think in that regard... Uh, gospel magic, uh, there's a little bit of, um, I don't want to say, eh, blindness implies ignorance, which isn't fair, but uh, I, I think there's something that they're able to compartmentalize the storytelling aspects, and there's wonderful, wonderful storytelling ap aspects of magic. If you want to make your point, whether it's about calculus or physics or about how Jesus you know, saves, uh, magic is a, a functional tool for that. It is unfortunate that there is an inherent conflict in using methods of deceptions and appearing to perform miracles to sell someone on a religion where they perform miracles. Uh, but having said that, one of the, one of the, the greatest compliments I ever got was when the, uh, the, the very famous gospel magician, Andre Cole, happened to be in town, came on out to, to my show, and here I am on my show with like a, a Satan puppet. And, uh, <laughs> Mr. Happy. Yeah, exactly. You didn't bring you know, them, did you? All the good uh, stuff. And, yeah. and, and, and it's like, 
I, I know there's a whole room like this size in there, but I'm only performing to Andre Cole, and I'm thinking twice about everything I say, you know? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I find that, that, that um, despite the, uh, the cognitive dissonance, uh, I, I find that, and I hope that they, that they too are truth seekers, and that if there is somebody who would deceive people like a Peter Popoff, that the first people in line to take them down would be gospel magicians. Yeah. So in that regard, I would I'd love to see him under the tent. Well, I must say that uh, one of my, the best friends I ever had in my whole life, just recently deceased, is Martin Gardner. Yeah, that's, uh, I was going to actually bring we, him up. And we yeah. know his name, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. If the rest had, of you should be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> if I had a God, it might be Martin. And he would be so embarrassed to hear that. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> but I must say that Martin called me late in his life, and we were just chatting one afternoon. And he said, you know, Randy, I, I should tell you something. Uh, I'm a deist. And I, w I was on the phone. I, I think I said something like, but <laughs> I said, really? And he said, yes, I'm a deist. He said, now that just means that I believe that there is probably some sort of superior power out there. I don't know what it is. And I don't have any evidence for what I'm claiming. You have all the evidence on your side, so I can't argue the point with you at all. But it makes me feel more comfortable about my impending demise. Now, wait a minute. If that was important to Martin Gardner, it was equally important to me as far as Martin retaining that, that image in his mind. He said, I have no proof whatsoever. You've got all the proof on your side and the arguments, and you win them all. There's no question of it. But I still prefer to have this belief. If it's a preference and it brings Martin Gardner, this lovely old gentleman, if that brings him comfort, I'm all for it. So I surrendered that point to him. I said, we'll go ahead from that point on. I, I, I think we've got to have that in our minds and we've got to have it in our personality to be forgiving of these things. He didn't say there was a God. He said, I'm a deist and I believe that that's a distinct possibility. That's all. Well, and uh, I had to respect we're, it. We're that. a dragon con. That deism to me is the force. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, yeah. I, so it, it brings up some of the things like, what do you think? Like, it's, we have like pop off, right? You. you no, you have pop off. I, I know. I know. <laughs> so, so you really destroyed pop off. Have you ever seen the videos of the what he? how he took him down, right? Everybody's seen it, right? So, so uh, go, there, there's probably people who didn't because there's yeah. younger people here. Peter Popoff was a TV evangelist, and he um, it still is, actually. Yeah, yeah. You, can oh, yeah. Still, you can still watch his show you know, now. But um, the amazing Randy exposed how he was uh, getting words from God uh, to, to audience members. It's the dumb, same way you get it. So the, oh, no, 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 no. His wife. He's, he's teaching. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. His system was much more elaborate than mine. So, um, But he exposed it on national television. On the Johnny Carson show. On the Johnny Carson show. And thought that was the end of it. And it, it's, he still has his own TV show. So, you know, what does that well, tell you? Well, so, so I, I'll tell you what it tells you is that uh, there are many people who feel like, and I really bristle when I see uh, skeptics uh, just, you know, coming away pumped up on testosterone, like, I won that argument. I proved my point. And, you know, meanwhile, uh, uh, the, 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 the phrase from, you know, Dave Ramsey, of all people, says those convinced against their will are of the same opinion still. You know, it's like, yeah, um, uh, yeah you won, but you're still an asshole. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't have it. So uh, it, Don't I, be a dick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's and that's important, and I think it's important that um, I think the metaphor matters. I think it's great that we are winding down this metaphor against a culture of, uh, considering the war on drugs, and instead coming up with a new way to think about it, like an outpatient therapy situation. Uh, and I think skepticism needs that. I think the metaphor should not be a war that is won, but we're not building a war, or we're not waging a war. We are building a dam. That pressure will always be there, that temptation. It is built into us that we want to believe the easy, simple, compelling narrative. And it's up to patient, kind, uh, uh, those who are, are, are uh, you know, more familiar with the techniques of deception and self-deception 
to, to give those tools to other people and understand that they're going to lapse and we're all going to, and we're all blind in some way. You know, we've all fallen for it. I mean, there was a fantastic article uh, where Michael Schirmer confessed that he, you know, bought into the airborne uh, uh, vitamins, you know, like, oh, yeah, of course I'll keep away a cold. Oops. You know, we can't yeah. be all experts on all the things. I did it on my show once where I thought I had met and hung out with Perry from the Skeptics Guide to the Universe. I don't know if you heard that episode when I interviewed with, with uh, Steve Novella. And I swore, I left it in the show because I thought it was great. And I told him, I, I love the time when I met Perry. He's like, where would you have met him? I said, at Tam. So he never came to Tam. Mm. He, never, he never came out. He never went anywhere. The only way you could have seen him is if you were at one of our events like in Connecticut. Yeah. I was like, seriously? Because I remember him behind a table. You, you guys, he's like, no, it didn't happen. I left it on the show because it just proves. I, it, it's still in my head. I mean, if there's one fact I wish I could bestow upon the world, it's that we're all flawed wetware. And having said all that, <laughs> we've done really great work for being flawed wetware. <laughs> yeah, we have done all right, you know. We're still here. Yeah. Well, most of us. <laughs> so... <laughs> Where do you think magicians can fit into promoting more skepticism to the general public? I know Randy, I, I think he's already done it. I mean, on the Johnny Carson show. But you had that distinct opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. So how do we get more of that on TV? It, it's hard. I, I haven't seen anything as good as that since. Well, it, it's difficult, Derek. See, one of the things I get after so many shows is I always... I, when I say a show, I'm talking about a lecture now that I give them all over the world. I just came back from a few weeks ago from uh, Finland and from Italy, for example. And uh, I get very good reactions on these, uh, these lectures that I give. But I will always get some people after the show coming to congratulate me. And, oh, I agree and the whole thing. Uh, by the way, I, I liked where you did so-and-so. You did this. And that was, I always do some mentalism during the show to show them that they can be fooled as well. And uh, I've got some pretty slick stuff, too. I think. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk. Okay. Uh, and, uh, You're under Brian's uh, show's going to be better next year, too. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be controlled by Randy from the audience. Yes, but the, the point is that they will, they will come to me uh, from the audience afterwards to, to chat and sometimes on stage even. And they'll say, uh, I really liked where you did so-and-so. That, that's... It's very clever and such. But, but when you told the lady from the audience uh, her phone number and you had never met her before, uh, that was ESP, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I, my heart yeah. sinks a little bit at that point, knowing that I haven't quite gotten across, you see. And I will say, no, 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 that's a trick as well. Wait a minute. And they'll, say, they'll really just get, get infuriated with you. I know the difference between a trick and a... And, and, a real thing, you know. That was the real thing. You couldn't possibly have known yeah. her telephone number. You never met her before in your life. Yes, but uh, no, no, I don't want to hear any excuses. No, you've you've lied to me, and you've you've lost me as a fan. And they walk away. I, I don't really consider that to be much of a loss. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, they really think they've won a point. Yeah, I showed him. <laughs> well, I mean, has that happened to either of you, uh, Brian or? I, I had a really weird thing. I was at my son's school, and this lady comes up to me, and she says, I heard you're a mentalist. And I told her, yeah, I do some mentalism, and I did a thing for her. And she goes, so is that real? And I said, no. And she goes, well, you know, how can you tell if it's real or it's fake? I said, it's easy. It's all fake. <laughs> and she said, well, what, 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 what? You know, what about these psychics and stuff? So I, I explained to her, and I... I, I gave her some places online to look and explain some of the principles and stuff behind it. And um, so, you know, I, I told her about an incident I had with a psychic and, and she goes, wow, she goes, that's really, I'm so glad with this conversation. That is absolutely, I mean, enlightening. You have helped me so much. I'm glad the lady I go to is not like that. <laughs> I should have seen that coming. And I said, excuse me? She goes, oh, no, I fly down to Miami because she's real. It costs me thousands of dollars, but I don't go to these people on the side of the road, you know. She and, goes to the uh, real one. Yeah, the she goes one. to the real one. Like, I, you know, 
right I, that right there i think yeah. proves the point of why we need more skeptics yeah. out in the world yeah. it, it, it's it's not just because we want to like throw wet blankets on the world we want to save those people this happens more to older people than anybody else do well I, I, here's one thing I would advocate for. Um, uh, in the days when, uh, in pre-internet era, you could only get the message out with a big explosive gotcha moment, like or, what or happened on, on The Tonight Show. Yeah, uh, and, and that, was, that was a great use of 20th century media to get the word out. Uh, but nowadays, because we live in the internet, uh, I, I'm hopeful that we're entering an age of 21st century peer-to-peer -peer skepticism where not everybody knows the entire thing the way top-down media traditionally was, but instead uh, a bunch of people are fans of scam school and it's like, well, I know three or four tricks that look like I can do mind reading because I watched this YouTube video and I tried them on my friends and I know enough to know that I can be fooled and that I can fool other people and that hopefully uh, it will spark, instead of one big discussion about one guy who happens to be a fraud, hopefully it would spark, you know, a billion tiny discussions that will nudge humanity in, in the right direction. Uh, just to show you how disappointed you can get, though, when you're trying to get your point across, I remember on, uh, there was a CBS program, well, uh, it was sort of a news program, but they featured uh, W.V. Grant, who was one of the evangelists who used all these tricks in order to deceive people into thinking that he was speaking directly with God. And uh, I was there with the TV crew. Now, I must admit at the time, I was dressed up as Adam Gerson. And A-D-A-M-J-E-R-S-I-N. If you rearrange that, it forms James Randi, you see. <laughs> and, uh, but I was wearing a red wig, and I had dyed my beard temporarily, of course, red and I was wearing black contact lenses. And uh, that disguised me well enough that I could stump around in a, a $25 suit and uh, look like a, like a faith healer or whatever or anything I wanted to. And uh, I disguised myself to go to this particular meeting and I, I got a hold of the crew and I said, let's, let's talk to this lady here. There was a lady walking along with two canes, poor dear soul, and stumbling along very patiently and very slowly. And I stepped up to her and I said, excuse me, ma'am, uh, could I ask you, are you here to be healed by Reverend Grant? And she said, oh yes, oh yes, I know Reverend Grant from, from many years back and he's going to heal me, there's no question of it. I've been sending him donations for months now and he has communicated with me, he's going to heal me. And I said, very well, could we speak to you after the service? And she said, oh, I'll be here, I'll be here, oh yes. And she waved onto her canes at me, she stumbled, into the audience. Well, she eventually got up on the stage. She was interviewed by Reverend Grant, and he struck her on the forehead and told her that she was healed. The attendants had to grab her, of course, because she would just fall to the floor. It was the, you are healed. Yes, God. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and held her up again, and uh, she went and she sat down again. And when she came out of the audience, I watched for her carefully, and I grabbed the crew, and I said, here she is. And she was coming towards us with her two canes stumping along exactly the same way she had been when she went, went up on the stage. And I stepped up to her, and it was, it was tough. I stepped up to her and I said, ma'am, you, you said you would be healed by Reverend Grant. He doesn't appear to have healed you. And she said, oh yes, that's entirely my fault because I didn't have enough faith to get across and God wasn't listening to me as he should, but but I, I will try again sometime. And she started to stumble off, and I already saw her back there, and the cameraman luckily stayed on her back. And uh, she turned around and she said, but don't make any errors. I still believe, I still believe. And went down, down at the cane and she stumbled off. Uh, you cannot, even the evidence is right there. Reverend Grant said she was healed and she could walk again. And the, the audience went crazy. She had evidence that she wasn't healed at all. So the and audience. Then, then the attendants got her backstage and said, well, oh, that was your fault, you know, because you didn't have enough faith. Yeah. And she believed it right away. And so she's, you know, you can't convince them, no matter what the evidence is. So this brings me to the point that really, then we as skeptics are just the, I would not say band-aid, the, the warning label 
against those things. Which yeah. is an yeah. unfortunate and difficult place to be, um, yeah. because if you want to showboat, then skepticism's probably not for you. Uh, skepticism is a place for people who are kind and patient and, uh, and willing to admit they're wrong and willing to say the same thing eight freaking thousand times. <laughs> uh, and, and that's fine. You know, that, that to me is, is a very fine stoic role for us to play. I mean, well, you know, I guess you could look at it from the snarky side and say, well, then it's never going to end, but, you know, at least I'll have a job. <laughs> <laughs> it's like doctors, I guess, right? You always have a patient. Sure. So, unless we solve death. Singularity, <laughs> I believe. So, I, it's funny, what Randy was talking about, it reminds me of, I had an interview with Lynn Kelly, if anybody knows Lynn Kelly. She's from Australia. She made up from whole cloth a system of like a like a gypsy kind of system with cards and sticks and incense. Made it all up completely. How to like can, can tell people's fortunes, and she did it on the side of the street, like they had little street fairs, and she still, after like 15 years, has people calling her. Even though she wrote a book, showed exactly, showed all of them how it was done, told them all how fake it is, and she still has more than half of those people still, years later, getting back in touch with her because they want to give her money to get another reading, and she won't do it, and they keep getting mad at her. So yeah. how, it, we're, so like, it, point of proof is we're never going to solve that. I, we, weirdly, I, I don't know. I, I, have a, I have a complicated relationship with the self-help movement. When I quit my day job, I did a lot of, uh, read a lot of those self-help books, got energized. Uh, you know, I, I truly do believe that the closest thing to real magic that exists is the power of the written gold because uh, all my wishes have come true and so on. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm aware that it's all nonsense and pseudoscience, uh, likely, uh, but... At the end of the day, it provides structure for self-reflection. And if you want to, uh, uh, for example, neurolinguistic programming has a bunch of nonsense rules. If they look up and left, that means they're lower right. Blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, what they're doing is they're saying, here's a nutty idea, asshole. Why don't you pay attention to what the other person looks like with their body language? <laughs> and then you feel like you have some kind of wizard power, right? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, it's a, and, and in that regard, yeah, you can manufacture a pseudoscience and, and it can, it can, even if, you know, whatever right means, um, it, it can provide a structure for somebody to go through an experience of self-reflection and get a positive benefit out of it. Let me see a show of hands. Every here's, I'm assuming a skeptic, being such, how many people who here wanted to find out at least one or two tricks that you can use to help people be warded against some of these crappy things without making people mad. That's pretty much everybody. So. Well, there ain't none. Good night. <laughs> you could, you could actually buy Brian's new book. <laughs> How to win friends and get lost. Well, here, here's the thing, too, and it's, it's kind of reiterating what we just went over. You, it, it doesn't matter if it's skepticism or anything else in life. You cannot want something else for somebody. You cannot want something for somebody else more than they want it for themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't change somebody. You know, you can talk to your blue in the face. You can't change somebody. But I'm, what I'm thinking about is, yeah, you can't change somebody with, like, one thing. Right. But what do you think might be one thing that would at least crack the magic shell to, like, let more reason in? Um, what would be your suggestion? I, I mean, look, in a perfect world, what you would have is Where you is would that have, perfect world yeah. you keep talking about? It's <laughs> all <laughs> <Someone> we got. <laughs> in, a, in a perfect world, there would be some kind of, and you could never get away with doing this on network television. It would have to be an internet show, and it would have to give people the tools of skepticism, but they would have to disguise it like some kind of baser instinct, like to score a free beer or something. You mean Sam And over the course of like 400 episodes... <laughs> You'd I have to slowly that, <laughs> teach people how to think like a magician. And if it went really well, you'd get a million subscribers and you'd have a hundred million plus views. So you know, you've already done what you No, I, I, I wish I could pretend like, I, like it was all part of some master plan. But, but it is, it is, part, I mean, look, uh, there's a lot of people... 
they, 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 there are some people disagree with with uh, the tools that we teach on Scam School, and, and I have to be very polite and kind I to all of them. I would love to hear what would the, be the problems. What's that? Oh, uh, oh, are you kidding? Uh, 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 <laughs> my new favorite group of people are locksmiths uh, who okay. realize that they uh, uh, pedal fear and. Uh, and that, you know, if, uh, and that, you know, explaining how to make a bump key, even though, you know, legally we are very clear, you use it on your own locks and lock picking is a perfectly fine hobby. They have tournaments yeah. and, you know, we're going to teach you how to, how to pick locks, uh, and become maybe a little James Randy, you know, and, uh, uh, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the trouble is, I recognize them. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the, you know, there there are certain mentalists who who play mentalism hard that feel like you know understanding some fundamentals of mentalism is like it makes it too easy. They, 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 there's an entire subgroup of magicians that if they could, they'd lock up all the books, keep it at the top of a mountain. You'd have to come up and and uh, you know acolyte there for 10 years before you got to learn, you know, how to use a thumb tip. By the way, there's a thing called a thumb tip. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if anybody ever got a magic kit as a kid, I think you know what that is. <laughs> but, take, uh, take his card from him, Randy. No, take his card. No. You asked a question, uh, Derek. You said, how could we, could we do this? And I have had a sort of acute way that I've used for uh, many decades now. I, if I get somebody who really wants to tell me the whole story and they bore me for a good 10 or 12 minutes going through every detail of why they believe and such, I look at them and say, hmm, you may be right. And then I turn away to, and to somebody else right away. And that is the worst thing they want to hear because they want to go on arguing and, 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 and specify all the details of their lives that they haven't told me yet, which would take the rest of the day. But you may be right and just turn away. And it works. It works. You see. Yeah, you, you can't argue. Yeah, yeah. It's true. Well, absolutely. It's funny because you told me that a long time ago when we had a breakfast one time, that story. And later on, at my office, some guy got hired. And he's a believe, he was a big believer in the, the, the fat law miracle that happened. Mm -hmm. okay. And the, the miracle of the sun. Ever hear about that one? Fatima. Fatima, I'm sorry. But anyway, it was a bunch of people. That was saw a different thing. <laughs> you got to keep your miracles straight now. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Get the real ones and the fake ones. I'm sorry. There you go. Uh, I already saw this one miracle in the sky, and it's all these people saw, so therefore it's true. Anyway, I decided to use what Randy told me. I said, huh, "Might be right." Walked away. That guy pestered me <laughs> until the day he quit. <laughs> He quit the company. Well, that, but, was, uh, and, and, that was my brother. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's actually a really good point because the morally superior, or I guess uh, the argumentally uh, superior position is to be the one where they're the ones who want to know. And it's like um, the quieter you get, the harder they'll listen. Yeah. And so if, they, if they're picking a fight, if they want to, don't, you know, don't be the shouter. The shouter always loses. Uh, it's a salesman tactic. The person asking the questions is the one in charge of the conversation. So ask questions. Well, Keep on asking. It's funny because uh, Randy's here. He would like this. In my book kale shelf in my office above my desk, I have all skeptic books. So then the guy came to my desk again. It was funny. It really was. And I said, I, he sort of said, you know, I want you to read this. I give him flim fam, and I just went back to work. Well, and, and, uh, so so essentially, you did a version of there is again this motivational speaker who told me this to it, which is why I'm still in love with motivational speakers. Uh, but he said that uh, you know Bruce Lee never met force with force; he always took uh, force and redirected around him. Right, just be faster than the other guy and moved around. And so he said basically, um, not that you can win any argument, but if you want to effectively communicate your permission and get or your position and get somebody listening, you just need to say three things. You say, uh, you say, I hear you, because that's the first thing most people don't, you, you know, they, they want to know they've been heard. You're like, I used to think the same thing. Here's what I learned that got me around that. And that's all you need. Those are that, that, they, if, if you're looking for a miracle cure out of this, I hear you, I used to think the same thing, but then I learned this. And then they'll come up with something else and you'll say, guess what? I hear you. <laughs> I used to say the same thing. And here's Snopes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm glad my psychic's not like that. <laughs> no, no, I, I would never do <laughs> wrong. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> do, uh, uh, do we have time to take some questions yeah, from the audience? Yeah, a lot of people I line like, up. Yeah, the everybody line I up. I guarantee you, we have a big, crowded house. I know you're all minutes. excited to talk to Kurt Anderson. <laughs> Make it a question. Oh, yes. Uh, first of all, Schwood, I, I've got my rogues ring, and I came all the way down. All right, I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> Fine, get <laughs> um, My question's for all three of you, but I'd be particularly interested in hearing uh, Mr. Randy's answer. Uh, short, I mean, us less than religious types are famously not particularly evangelical. Um, but the more that I have lived, the more I realize I think the world would be better with more skepticism. Uh, what can we do short of becoming a famous musician, <laughs> pardon me, magician, and <laughs> I'd like to be a famous musician too, but um, short of becoming a famous magician and offering exorbitant sums of money to prove uh, something that's supernatural, what could we do out here to promote skepticism? I mean, to be honest, uh, I've said this before, I think the James Randi Educational Foundation's Million Dollar Challenge is, is uh, a fundamentally, universally important tool because it settles bar bets the world yeah. over <laughs> and arguments, you know, where it's like, well, if it is, then blank. You know, it's, and, and to be honest, you know, don't pick a fight. In fact, don't fight. All of you, stop fighting. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, listen, and then, uh, you know, well, tell on, the truth on, as you see it. On that point, here's a really... I think the, the, the better step is find your local IIG group. And they have a smaller award that gets you to the Million Dollar Challenge. And that's, I think, a little more, more com com comfortable to some people. And, uh, and it gets them thinking. It's not, you're not going to say, wow, you're a million dollars. It, it just, it, that just sounds ridiculous. But, you know, 50000 bucks. You know, your friends that you know have friends in IAG because you know it is just groups, grassroots people. So it would, I think that feels less intimidating. But also, I, I've run into people because it's always nice to have different resources to point them to, and the internet is great for that. But sometimes you'll talk to somebody and they'll go, Well, no, no, this isn't supernatural power, so they wouldn't qualify for that. We're talking about somebody that's psychic, <laughs> you know, or there's just like people's version. Their, how they view it is what's important. We, we can't see it that way. So one person sees a psychic and they go, well, that's a fake. Somebody else goes, well, that's a miracle worker. And somebody else goes, it's neither, they're psychic. Mm -hmm. So there's people that think they're, they've seen supernatural things, but that doesn't qualify for the James Randi Foundation. So I, I think it's just good to, in skepticism in general, have different resources, um, you know, bookmark those in the internet, and then when somebody's got one, you can go to and go, oh, this may be helpful. And I'd be glad to go through and just look through this, and, you know, we, we can research this together. Yeah, sometimes you can use YouTube. You'll yeah. find fun people who have debunked things on YouTube that are just regular people who just do it because they think it was fun, but they don't realize they're doing really good skeptical work, but yet it's just, I found some really great things out there. Like there's the example that... Uh, that uh, Evan did with the dojo talk where he showed the guy who said, I'm making my force field and all that. And the other guy was like, okay. And then he just, I mean, he probably did permanent damage to the guy's arm <laughs> on video. I mean, it, a lot of blood. And show, proved him. He doesn't have this secret mystical power. He was one of the fake ones. He's not the real. Yeah, right. that's saying. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I mean, although uh, he specifically said he wanted to hear uh, Randy's take. So let's, yeah, really, let's, let's clear the dance floor. <laughs> Yeah, I'll read my books. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean that semi-seriously. Uh, yes, I think that uh, particularly my latest one, which is not printed yet, but I'm sure you will be in first in line. But uh, I, I, I'm very proud of those books. And I must say that in writing this, my 11th one, I... Uh, came upon files that I had put away quite some time ago. And as I'm sitting there reading them on the computer screen, and I'm saying to myself, quite honestly, damn, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> and I am proud of, Self -love. of what I've done there. And uh, I, I would anticipate that uh, maybe that would be a good weapon for you to have. Thank you so much. Awesome. At Thank you. Computer. All right, who we got here? Hey, uh, two-part question. Would you agree that uh, Penn and Teller show bullshit did a lot to help skepticism along and then the second part of that question would be what's it going to take to get one of you guys you and Mr. Randy would be great uh, to start another show like that um, that would help promote skepticism yeah well, I was thinking one called bull poop <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's too close uh, it's a no, Canadian version <laughs> flat doodle <laughs> well Penn and Teller are very very close friends of mine as I'm 
I'm sure you, you put them together, know. didn't you? Pardon? You put them together, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Well, in a, in a way, yes. It, it was a, an interesting confrontation, I must say. But uh, they were they were sort of aware of one another at that point. But I helped to cement it a little bit better, I think, somewhere along the line. But uh, I must say that these two gentlemen, uh, when they have done their TV series and such, I've sat in great admiration and just watched them do it because there's a lot of psychology that the average person doesn't see in the way Teller doesn't say anything. As a matter of fact, he said to me just the other day. <laughs> That's quick, you see. <laughs> the ordinary audience just sits there silent, waiting for me to go <laughs> what he said. Congratulations. Oh, I'm in the right crowd. <laughs> but uh, no, the, the, uh, the bullshit series and such was very, very good, and it was very well done. And uh, they've done just as good things since, and a lot of those are not yet seen, so keep tuned. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, um, I just wanted to say thank you to each of you for coming down here and spending the time here. Uh, my question was about magicians that uh, perform stunts and then uh, they, they claim that they just did it for real. Um, the morality behind that. I, I, I think when someone goes into a magic show or is watching a magician perform, that they've already kind of signed an invisible contract saying, I'm going to be deceived. But then for someone to perform a stunt and then really like claim, like, oh, I held my breath that long, that's how I really did it. Like, morally, where does that stand? Like, Yeah, that, that's a difficult question to answer because you can't interfere with it with a person's performance on stage, you, you have to make the assumption, I guess, that your audience is smart enough to know that this is an actor on the stage. But you're absolutely right. Some of them do sell it as if it were the real thing. Uh, Kreskin, for example, uh, sold for years, he sold the idea that he really had these mental powers. And now he's reduced to, are you ready for this? Selling methods for winning the national lottery. Now, hold on. Randy. Why would you sell that if you know how to win the National Lottery? I think you could make your money directly just by handing in the numbers. Yeah, give me the now, money, thank you. Randy, didn't you actually kind of kind of sneakily show that Creston was BS with uh, Johnny Carson? With his act with the, the cards and things? Was that something that you helped him with? Which, which Gary, with the cards? Gary Geller. No, no, no the, 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 the whole with the... I can read somebody's card and get the, the answer before they ask, see the question. Wasn't that some of the... No, I think we've, we've got a couple of stories mixed up here. All right. Somewhere along the line. But uh, Johnny did come to me at one point. He came to my dressing room before the show. That means it's serious. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just a little tap on the door. I invited him in, and he showed me what Kreskin had done. And I won't get into the details of it, but it was a simple trick that you could buy at Tannen's Magic Shop in those days. And uh, Johnny looked at me and said, he knows that I know magic, and yet he did this thing with this table, and he put it down again, and he said, you know, John, I don't know how that's done. And I said to him, that's a strange ring you're wearing. And he immediately dropped his hand and said, oh, yes, that's, uh, I've had that for years. And, uh, and he, Johnny told me, he said, Kreskin will never appear on this program again. Because John wanted to be, didn't want to be confided in as to how the tricks were done, but he didn't want someone trying to come to him and say, this is the real thing, John, when he knew better. You know what, that's, uh, that's actually a really good point, because there are parts of my show that are 100% real, when, you know, doing the human blockhead and right. fire The sideshow thing. Yeah, Greg, there's stuff that's 100% fake, you know, there's a mind reading and so on, but there is stuff that's somewhere in the middle. And... Uh, to me, the, the rules of the game are, while you are on stage, everything is fair game. The moment somebody looks you in the eye and asks a question about it, uh, you are obligated, I'd say you are definitely morally obligated to not continue to push them in the, the, the station and all that. Personally, however, I will, I will just uh, you know, answer a question with a question with something like, uh, that was pretty great, wasn't it? <laughs> Man. Well, what I do, and, and some of you saw the Jailbreak the Mind show last year that I did, um, and I've been adding more real things into the show where, like, I roll a frying pan up with my bare hands and some strength stuff and some, some things. Which and is actually mainly leverage, right? Yeah, it, it, well, it is actual strength training and technique, yeah. both. 
Um, but what I do at the beginning of the show is I say, look, some of the things I'm going to do tonight are completely real. Some of them are completely fake, and some of them are hybrid of the two. It's your job to figure out which I'm not going to tell you. And if you ask me afterwards, I'm not going to tell you if you're right or wrong. Because if you say, well, hey, I think I figured this out. Did you do blah, blah, blah? And I go, no, that's not how I did it. Well, did you do blah, blah, blah? No, that's not how I did it. Did you do blah, blah, blah? Well, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's a clue right there. Right? Yeah. Me, yeah. Yeah. Sucker. <laughs> so I just I tell everybody I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you. I don't have any supernatural powers or anything like that. But what I do on stage, some of it's real, some of it's not. You don't have to figure it out. Just sit back and enjoy it. If you want to try to figure it out, that's fine. But I'm not telling you. I just want you to be the yeah. yeah. Our, okay. our job, it, it, this, is, this may sound crazy. None of us, our job is not to fool anybody. Our job is to entertain people. Now, if we don't fool people along the way, we're probably not doing our job properly. But some people, and most of the people in this crowd, are entertained by taking a look at something and going, I think I know how he did that and trying to figure it out. Other people want to sit back and just go, I don't care how he did it, that was pretty cool. Um, if you took the time out of your life to think about one of the tricks that I did and then try to come to me and tell me how I did it, I've already done my job. doesn't matter if you know how I did it or not. Yep. So. Yeah. This will hey. be the last question. Oh, man. Well, you can, you, we you can do one-word answers from here on out. But, but <laughs> people can hang around afterwards. Maybe we can field a few personally. Yeah, we'll probably, yeah. Cool. So uh, you talked a little bit earlier about how the Internet is actually helping to promote skepticism by having a way that people can you know, de debunk things very easily. But on the other side of that, the internet also promotes a whole lot of blind, oh my God, that's exciting, let me share it. Do you feel that it's going in one direction or another? I kind of feel we're losing the battle, but, uh, and, and if it is going in one direction or the other, again, how do we help it? Well, just well, only just believe it, it's on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just the internet, it's the media in general. You go to an editor, you're a reporter, you're a columnist, whatever, and you present an idea to an editor. If it sounds good, they're going to print it because they don't care whether it's true. They're not looking into the morality of the thing, whether that's going to hurt anybody up the line, unless they're thinking of lawyers at the same time, of course, and we're all lawyered up these days, aren't we? <laughs> uh, but the point is, the media just doesn't care, basically. They want a story. They've got so many columns to, to fill in the newspaper. They've got so many minutes on TV they have to fill, and it's got to be bang at the end of the thing for the next commercial. And so, in a way, you can't blame them. But what's, what's the expression? They're whores. <laughs> so, the media is a whore. That's H.L. Mencken, and he was absolutely right. Uh, yeah, speaking of which, uh, there's a fantastic book, uh, Trust Me, I'm Lying, by Ryan Holiday. He's That's somebody who used to, uh, uh, he uh, did what he called trading up the chain, which was post, uh, he, would, he would buy an ad, de deface his own ad, plant okay. a blog post story at the local level, uh, forward it from a fake email account to somebody at a more respectable blog. Before you knew it, it's in the New York Times. Um, uh, it's fantastic uh, to, to see that break, break down. Uh, yeah, read that book. Very cool. Well, that was the last question. So that will conclude. Thank you guys for coming.